Greetings, listeners. Stan couldn't join us this week. He'll be back with us next week. But we have a special guest, the incredible creature designer, Terrell Whitlatch. Here we go. Hi, Terrell. Hello. How are you? I'm glad to see you and glad to get a chance to talk with you. How are you today? Oh, I'm well. We're enjoying a beautiful sunny day here in Northwestern Oregon. Like, wow, the sun. And I'm not sure. Maybe it's a UFO. Really? We're You're grateful in- for the rain. We are grateful for the rain because we know all the hardships that our neighbors to the south have been suffering. And we had our own taste of it over, you know, in the fall. So hmm. we're grateful for the mud and the rain and the wetness. <laughs> but right now you've got sun in Oregon, huh? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And here I am in Southern California where it never rains and yet it rained today well, and it will throughout the day. So this is our moment of counter change. Oh, well, congratulations. That's something to great be grateful for. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got things to talk about, don't we? Yes. <laughs> Let me take a moment to introduce you, although I know that many of our listeners know about your career already. And if they don't know about your career and you by name, they know your work because you have a list of clients and a list of accomplishments that is amazing. And the first time that your name started to get known a lot publicly was because you designed Star Wars characters for the 1999 movie. Is that correct? Yes, that is very true. (laughs) You were doing work well before that. And you've done much since. Charlie, if you just put Terrell's client list and the stuff that she has worked on over the last three decades or so, it will be enough to keep the screen busy for a while. And uh, I want to talk with you about your career and how it happened, how it happened, even if you want to go back from the early influences that brought you to it. But one of the main things we're interested in is how you went from being an amateur to a professional. (laughs) Oh, goodness gracious. Well, the first thing I guess I can say is that, you know, I never intended to be working in the entertainment industry, that is the movie and animation industry and, and other things related to that. I had always wanted to be a scientific illustrator, an illustrator that would work for, say, National Geographic or or the Smithsonian Institution or or um, that sort of thing from zoos, museums. I was just so fascinated by animals from a very, very, very early age, living things, and I loved drawing them. And I couldn't think of a happier thing to do than to be able to portray them for scientific institutions because I loved going to zoos and I loved going to museums and I was just raised on that. My my father would take my sister and I to our local zoos and museums when I was a little girl um, faithfully and uh, he was he also um, he taught biology and chemistry. He, uh, um, in the local high schools. And uh, he had also been all, all over the world as a naval officer. So when he wasn't on the carrier, he was teaching. And so there was this kind of this travel, sense of travel, sense of adventure, sense of love of nature and science that I, I that w- has just been imbued in me since I was a tiny, tiny girl. So, How about your mom? My mother um, is an artist. She's still living. And uh, she was always drawing and painting. And uh, to this day, she does little editorial cartoons for some local newspapers. Mm-hmm. And so I had both those, those two influences, a um, love of, of nature and then you know, art. And that was going on at the same time. Okay. So how did it go from science into the arts? <laughs> well, as I mentioned, I wanted to be a scientific illustrator, natural history illustrator. And that crystallized and became very solid when I was about 15 years old in high school. I think I was a sophomore and I knew I wanted to do something with science and something with art. And 
I'm not sure how this happened, but the senior scientific illustrator from UC Berkeley uh, was invited by, I guess, one of the science teachers to our little high school, and I got special permission to attend the talk he was given. And he's, and I could see that, gosh, he's doing, he's what I want to do. Uh, he is illustrating for scientific papers. He's illustrating field guides. He did a beautiful field guide of birds of the San Francisco Bay Area. And he was gracious enough to mentor me for the rest of my high school days and into my early college days. Mm-hmm. It was Gene Christman at, of UC Berkeley, and he's, he was just wonderful. And so I majored in vertebrate zoology. And uh, while there's still a little bit of college money, and this was, you know, decades ago when college wasn't anywhere as t- expensive as it is now, I decided to spend a couple of semesters at um, a couple of local art schools. I was um, born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. In order to graduate with uh, from one of the art schools, that was um, the Academy of Art, um, we had to participate in a senior show, which was given each year in the springtime. And so I submitted some artwork and it was all of real animals. It, it was like, it was like you know, wildlife and I had some, obviously some life drawings, stuff like that, but mostly all real animals. I didn't have dragons or unicorns or space age things or that sort of thing at all. Just real animals. Because I knew I wanted to be a scientific illustrator. The night after the show, I got a call from Lucasfilm. They wanted to hire me to do creature design and starting on one of their video games, a Steven Spielberg project. And so they hired me out of school. It was on the strength of my, of my grounding in animal anatomy that they hired me. I see. It wasn't because I had spaced animals or, or aliens or dragons, like I said, or anything like that. Or it, there was nothing fantasy or sci-fi at all. I did have some illustrations of dinosaurs. I remember that. Um, but the rest was wildlife, and they, they hired me. And that's how my life changed. So it it partly had to do with the fact that Lucasfilm was in the Bay Area, or at least yes. in, in that port. So that, uh, that was before you would be able to do this over Zoom or anything like that, or yeah. over. Uh, yeah, I was local. Yeah, Lucasfilm at that point was located in San Rafael. At least Industrial Light and Magic was located in San Rafael, and then Skywalker Ranch, of course, is nearby in, in the little town of Nicasio. But it's basically. Greater San Rafael. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there was no Zoom. There wasn't really any internet to speak of. That was just in its infancy. Uh, And because it was like, you know, 1980, mid 80s. Yeah, mid 80s, I guess. And there wasn't even programs in, say, visual development, which we majored in was illustration. Mm -hmm. But that was great because if you train to be an illustrator, you have to be everybody. Mm-hmm. You've got to be the director. You've got to be the art director. You've got to be the lighter, the rigger. You've got to be able to imagine being able to do storyboards. You've got to be able to write a plot. Because you're in charge of the whole picture, you mean? You've got to know everything. Okay. So it was great, you know. We were, and we were. Tr- when I went, when I was at the academy, that was the end of the golden age of illustration for advertising art, and you were expected to be able to draw everything. I mean, obviously, we all have specialties, but the basics we had to be very solid in. Who were some of the illustrators that were active at the time that you were studying that had an influence on you? It's not, not as a kid, but as a grown-up. As a grown-up, as far as illustration and advertising art, David Grove was... David and Bernie Grove, Fuchs. yes. David Grove, Bernie Fuchs, Thad Ilk. Yeah, th- then we were in school around the same time because David Grove and Bernie Fuchs and Bob Peake and, yeah. and Mark English... Mark English, yeah. They were just the great advertising illustration gods of the time. Mm -hmm. Now, did you learn when you were in school the things that you needed to know for animal anatomy? Or was that stuff that you brought to it from your passion studies throughout childhood? The animal anatomy was stuff I brought to it. That did not come from art school. Okay. I studied that on my own. Of course, I had, you know, majored in zoology, but even so, I had studied, I had begun my animal anatomy studies long before entering my zoo major. And in fact, all that 
specialization actually allowed me to kind of coast through my <laughs> through my zoo major. I mean, I obviously had to take classes in chemistry and physics and and some higher mathematics. Uh, but as far as the biology went, I had already studied a lot of that on my own, and it was kind of like familiarity. And of course, I learned a lot of new things too, but still the basics were there. Um, I was very, very focused. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And in, in a word or in a phrase, that was, it had to do with animals uh -huh. and drawing and painting? Yes. I wanted to be able to draw and paint animals in such a way that it would force people to look at them as valuable and precious beings, to appreciate them on their own terms and not not what we think of them as, and as individuals and not objects, um, not generics. I mean, it's like people think of, oh, you know, wildebeest, that's what lions eat. I don't look at wildebeest that way. I think these are a group of animals. They live in a herd. That's their society. And each one is a little bit different from the other. They all have their different personalities. They have um, ways of communicating. They have emotions, they make decisions. Each animal is individual. And I think early on, you know, observing animals in zoos, also my grandparents had a horse ranch and I grew up with horses. Mm -hmm. And you see very early, early on that these, these are personalities. These are intelligent animals that you, you, they're just not a mass of creatures, of nondescript creatures. Did you have pets? Oh yes, yeah. I mean, with a, with, a with a dad who was, you know, into science and nature, he was always bringing stuff home. We had uh -huh. <laughs> we had all so many things. We we had well, obviously we had a, a, a cat and we had a little dog, but we also had rabbit. And, and we didn't have all these animals at the same time. I mean, it wasn't Noah's Ark, but uh, throughout my childhood, we had rabbits and you know guinea pigs and rats and mice and um, a tank of exotic fish and turtles and and newts and, uh -huh. of course, tadpoles that we would catch and watch metamorphose and then let go. At one time, we had an iguana. We had chinchillas. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a menagerie. I had a pet chicken. He followed me everywhere. <laughs> now, I, I can't help but imagine that when you had the work in the show, that someone at Lucasfilm saw at that show and then reported you as a person who is of interest to what they were doing, that it was unusual, that it was unique that anyone had work in that show that had so many animals or things in it that revealed the knowledge of anatomy? I would say that's the case. And my, my various instructors also you know, recognized, recognized that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, you had a reputation then? Yeah, I guess I, well, I was notorious for for that. Sometimes I would get bored in, in, in um, life drawing class. I would, I, my, my instructor for life drawing, I just loved her, was Barbara Bradley. She was Oh, Barbara so, Bradley who wrote the book on drawing people, yes. Oh, she was amazing. She was amazing. She was the most it's difficult, I mean, not in personality, but as far as her expectations mm -hmm. um, of her students. She was the most difficult instructor I'd ever had, but oh, I loved her because I learned so much. But uh, yeah, I would, I was notorious for getting somewhat bored towards the end of each session and turning the models into centaurs and satyrs and... <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. Yes, because you could. <laughs> but she was very sweet and very tolerant of that as long as I got the, the hands and the feet and the faces okay. <laughs> Uh, yes, I know her book and have uh, used it with students quite a bit. And she has some of the best stuff on drapery as far as yes. books that have little things on drapery. She oh, explains yeah. uh, some of that very well. So, she was your teacher for more than one term? Oh, yeah. I mean, when I transferred over, you know, I, I did have, you know, a body of work from, that I had done during my Zoe major. You know, I had done artwork to supplement uh, my, you know, papers and things that I had to write. And um, they just, well... They put me in, in all the senior classes and they just had me take them over and over again. <laughs> so, I was very fortunate to be able to have like, you know, four straight semesters with Barbara Bradley and her heads and hands and whatever figure classes, you know, she was taking. I would just go over and over again and, and they were so wonderful. And then, oh yeah, my other teacher, Kazu Sano, Kazuhiko Sano. Oh, I don't know. 
look him up when you do have a chance. He's just was so wonderful for painting uh-huh. and color sense. My gosh, he was just just beautiful, beautiful poetic sense of color. And mm-hmm. those two teachers were just so wonderful. Well, I'm getting that you stood out as a student who was good at what you did, but also specialized enough to be categorized as if we're going to do animals, monsters, fantasy creatures. If we're going to do these, we need someone who knows things that others don't. You mm-hmm. were the person. So, when, when you were contacted, uh, I'm interested in what happened after that because it's a, it's a frightening and daunting thing for even a student who shines, who is now moving from the safe world where I pay the school <laughs> and now they're going to pay me, which means the stakes are much higher. Oh, how yeah. did that? How did that feel? How did it happen? Tell us anything you want to tell us oh, about okay. the transition from school to profession. Well, of course, when I when I got that call, I was like, you know, thrilled, and then it's like, oh, it's Lucas Film. Oh my gosh, you know. I mean, there's not like this graduate graduate way of kind of easing your way into a higher base client. All of a sudden, there you are, and they had me come to Skywalker Ranch. Like, oh man. Uh-huh. <laughs> because it's and the art director for Lucas um, Arts, which was would have been the first job. He was so kind and nice, and he looked at my stuff and told me about the project and um, gave me some art direction. But basically, it was, you know, draw whatever you want as long as it has six legs and and inhabit all of the biological niches. Wow. Yeah. And this was a first job that happened quickly, and it was just, we've seen your work, we want you to do something for us, and they let you loose with the only parameter being six legs and what yeah. else? Uh, I, went, I would go into drive to their, their office about once a week um, in Lucas Arts office and uh, with my stuff. Again, you know, this is like you know, pre-security stuff. This is pre-internet. Uh-huh. Nobody's emailing. No one's using um, Hightail to send secure files. You, were, or, you know, either, either use FedEx, Federal Express, or you drive it over yourself. You know, this, this sensitive artwork. And but the, the feeling, the emotional feeling, get back to your original question, was like kind of this, this like, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> but then there's nothing to do but plunge in. And I thought, well, if they had confidence enough to hire me, then let's just believe in what they, let's, let me not worry about my own inner turmoil and worry about am I capable of doing that? I'm going to I'm going to put my confidence in their confidence. Mm-hmm. And that's what gave me confidence, not so much depending upon myself, but on their confidence in what they thought I could do otherwise they wouldn't have hired me or asked me in the first place. How long did this last? That was a good gig. That lasted at least 6 months, I think. Wow. At least 6 months because that was a lot of creatures to design and they all had to be designed such a way that they could animate them. You know, and but that's of course where the anatomy comes in because if you understand anatomy, then anatomy can be animated. It can be simplified and it can be animated. Were you exposed to rigging at that time, or did that come in later? It's just a little bit. Um, again, a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that was going on was kind of experimental. I remember playing with pixels and putting different pixels together, um, but uh, a lot of that. Those animation programs in in the late eighties, early nineties, they were they were pretty primitive. It was yeah. before Jurassic Park, right? Obviously, there were experiments early on with Pixar. Pixar originally came out of Lucasfilm, uh, and with Jurassic Park, originally they were going to do stop motion, but then there was a breakthrough in um, CG. Okay, yeah. When I was at Industrial Light and Magic, right shortly after that time, that was a great time to be there. Um, in between the dig and ILM, uh, I got a gig um, designing wildlife-themed products for the World Wildlife Fund. And that was kind of this interesting little sandwich. Can you tell us how that happened, how that job came about? I think it was somebody that knew somebody at... 
uh, uh, Lucas Arts as as the as the Dick was coming to a conclusion. So, oh, we have this, uh, you know, them. Uh, they're looking for an artist that can do animal theme stuff. And I said, oh, this will be fun. World wildlife fun. Yay. Hey, I'll do yeah. world life fun. And, and that was great because I designed everything from, you know, textiles, you know, animal designs from textiles to designing animal themed snow globes, sculptures, um, toys, cookie jars, Christmas ornaments. I got really good at drawing pandas eating bamboo. I can tell you that. But uh, <laughs> It was well, it, fun. It was a good feeling then to get branded, to get categorized, uh, associated with it. If we need this, we go to you. It it was it was kind of cool. I mean, I it, it I certainly wasn't anything I planned. I my I just worked really hard and tried to to give the best designs and the best drawings and artwork I could. And uh, then, as the interesting thing was, is then, as the that particular job was coming to an end, and I think I was a designer for them um, for about a year, and then um, the the licensing fee for World Wildlife Fund went to a different company. But right at about that time, uh, I got a call from Industrial Light and Magic. And it was Doug Chang. And he said, I need somebody that can do animals because we have this little movie where we're, we're working on called Jumanji. And so that's how, that's how I got hired by, by ILM. Mm -hmm. And Jumanji was my first official motion picture. I see. And that was so fun. That sounds wonderful, Terrell. Now, if, if your career started so quickly, was there any point in those first few years where you were worried? that the work would dry up? You know, I, I really wasn't. Um, maybe because I, I didn't allow myself to think about it. I was also had the advantage of being married at the time as well. And so there was, an, there was another, another person there. So um, that perhaps helped. Um, but uh, no, I think once I, I got hired by ILM, I, I, I didn't worry too much about that. Um, they, even when I, I, I'd work, go from show to show or from commercial to commercial, if there was anything that had an animal in it, they yeah. would just hand that, that to me. Yeah. <laughs> and usually there was some sort of animal or creature in, in whatever they were working on at any one time. And so, um, so I had work. Well, this is an argument for students to find what you love and integrate that into how you present yourself to the world because you have managed to do that, to take something you loved all the way from childhood and then to get the excuse to do it for your profession because people are paying you to do it for all of these big jobs. It's, it sounds wonderful. Now, because the people who know of you that knew of you before they came to this podcast, know your legendary status. I have had so many students, Terrell, in the animal drawing class when I ask them at the beginning of a semester and they write down who their favorite artists are, your name comes up more than anyone else that I know of for people who inspire them to do animals. So, from the outside, it looks as if you have you knew what you wanted to do from the time you were a kid. You got enough learning to do it. You got hired by a large famous entity and the career has happened. Uh, we want to hear some of what the struggles were, some of the difficulties in the job, some of the crises uh, that in the process of this, you must have had times where more than one job wanted you and you had to say no, which is an enviable problem. But it is an enviable problem. You can sometimes lose a client, someone else replaces it. Yeah, we want to hear the tough stuff. Well, I remember um, as far as different job offers coming in at the same time, I was working at ILM and I got an offer from a publishing company. And it would have been a nice long term gig, a series of wildlife education cards, you know, that kids would collect. And, and learn about wildlife. And I would be 
doing illustrations of these a combination of photographs and illustrations of wildlife from all around the world. I mean, species after species after species after species. And that was probably one of the hardest jobs I had to turn down because I was working on, you know, a number of films at the time. And uh, I had also put my portfolio out for, for Star Wars. You know, we at ILM, that was about the, the time when there was a possibility of working on that film. George was floating little hints around and we were, those of us who were interested at ILM had submitted our portfolios, but I was also pretty busy. But that was a really hard one because I would have loved to have worked on, on that project and it was a good publisher as well. Um, so that's when I can think of off the top of my hat. I think there were times, um, you know, it is working on movies is fast paced uh, depending upon the film, um, there are deadlines. Um, commercials are another example of things I worked on in ILM. They have an even faster deadline turnaround because it's almost entirely storyboarding. And there were times when I thought, gee, you know, in my heart of hearts, I'd ask myself, am I really good enough to, to do this? Because there, there were challenges um, um, all along the way. What, what were they? Were they at all technical challenges? Were they things that had to do with your drawing and painting and anatomy and knowledge skills? I was working obviously with a lot of very talented artists, and of course, we all had our own voice and and such. And I remember there were some times that I felt intimidated, like is my work, you know, good enough? And I think uh, those questions are the ones that troubled myself. Um, because I, I could see my artwork and see, I could see all the flaws. I mean, maybe other people wouldn't, but I would see that. And I would imagine that other people would, would see them, would see that too. Like, oh, I didn't get that, that leg quite right in that, in that particular animal or whatever. And a lot of times, you know, I was drawing many things from memory mm -hmm. and, uh, and feel. I remember drawing Clydesdale's from the Super Bowl commercial. That was one, the Super Bowl commercial, first Super Bowl commercial mm -hmm. um, with the Clydesdales. Was it a beer yeah. commercial? Yeah, the, where the Clydesdales or Clydesdale horses are playing football. Oh, okay. And it was an important, an important, important client. I think it was Anheuser Bush. It was a big client for ILM. And these storyboards couldn't just be, you know, storyboards. They had to be beautiful storyboards, like you'd want to put on your wall storyboards. And I thought, okay, so I'm drawing these horses so quickly. I can only do just a little bit of quick research. And so, thank God I love to draw horses, as I was saying. And, and it turned out great. I still have copies of those boards, you know. And uh, But I remember feeling very pressured because I had such a short turnaround. Yes. I mean, I basically was sleeping at ILM to get them done. Yes. Is, and that is not unusual then? No, no. Especially if you're doing storyboards, that's, that's going to be very high pressure uh, because, again, the time frames are short. Yes. Something that I think the, the starry-eyed aspirers forget is that when you get the job, you got the job. Yeah. And that it's going to be work. It is. It is. Being in the presence of other illustrators and concept artists, and people who have other skills, there can be a tendency to compare that that person is so good at this, so good at this. So, a common theme in what we've talked about on this podcast has been imposter syndrome. Oh, yeah. You confessed to me about 10 years ago that you experienced that, that sometimes that your, your work was not everything that you wanted it to be or knew that it could be. And that can be an astonishing revelation for a person who knows your work for the skill level that you have. Uh, has it slowed you down or does it, do you, does it go in waves? How you, you must because you get so much fan adoration recognize the level that you're at. So, I'd, I'd like to hear more about that if you are willing to talk about it. Oh, sure. Yeah. No, um, imposter syndrome where you feel like a fraud. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I certainly have experienced that many times, you know, in my life, like, wow, people are expecting me to do like these perfect animals. I, 
I, but I'm seeing that I'm not quite getting that elephant quite right, and and then I'll blow that up in my in my mind, like oh, the imposter syndrome. I've can be debilitating if you let it. And what I usually have to say to myself is like, stop telling yourself lies. You you've worked really hard. Obviously, you're not perfect. You'll never be perfect. You're not God, but you. Um, I and mean, this is me talking to me. But you just keep on trying. And just try and just keep doing your best because if you start to listen to those voices, you can get paralyzed. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be paralyzed. Being paralyzed is, you know, that's not fun. <laughs> I, I I don't have time to be paralyzed. I don't have. I have to tell myself I don't have time to listen to these negative voices. Yeah, uh, part of what I hear in there is that the there's an advantage in one way is that when you start when you've got an opponent, it can make you stronger. Mm-hmm. And uh, have you observed that the self-doubt can make you rebound to do even better work? Has that ever happened? Yes, I think so. And also the realization that I'm in good company. Mm. There are none. I cannot think of any of my peers who have not expressed the same thing. Wow. And these are artists that, you know, your students worship. Yeah, world class. Yeah, and and I think that some of your students may be well aware of who many of these other artists are that I have worked on on particular motion pictures, <laughs> and all of them, including some that you would not expect at the at the very least, have expressed feeling, "Oh, I'm not good enough," or "Ooh, this is an awful drawing. My life is over. I think I'll go work at Starbucks." I mean, I like Starbucks, and I, but you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I, I Do something else, in other words. Yeah. But yeah, I, ha- I cannot think of anyone, any other artist that I, have, that I consider myself, you know, that I have associated with or are friends with. They all have expressed that self-doubt and also have, you know, many of them, including myself, have had periods of kind of like these black periods, like, ugh. Nothing I do is good. Blah blah blah. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it's it's unpleasant, but uh, listeners, doesn't it make you feel good to know that you're not alone uh, yeah. in the company of the best people uh, are sensitive enough to know when it isn't working uh, just right. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else do you want to talk about, Terrell? Oh, gee, I get lots of questions about people that want to go into creature design. I also teach a course in creature anatomy um, via schoolism, mm-hmm. and that's that's a lot of fun. And I've certainly met a lot of interesting students and some very talented students. And I'm sure that some of the people listening are going to become your students by way yeah. of schoolism. But let's say that there are a few that will not be able to afford it, and you want to give them a few minute overview or an admonishment, advice, encouragement about what they what you would have them study. What what do you think as a person who's done it and a person who teaches it is worth sharing with them? The thing that makes the difference is you need to have a real love and empathy for real animals. Without that, you shoot yourself in the foot. Because the empathy and appreciation and caring for real animals translates into any creature, let's say imaginary animal, that you would design. Without that, it's just a shell, it's just an object. And also, there are really more jobs as far as creature design that have to do with real animals Mm -hmm. than, you know, imaginary creatures. If you can think of, okay, think on one hand, how many Star Wars level films, Avatar level films per year are in in production? Mm -hmm. Can you, you know, there's not that many. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the art departments are not real big. Sometimes, I mean, at the Star Wars art department, we had seven people tops at any one time mm. for the Phantom Menace. Mm-hmm. And the difference, so the difference is, is if you can, if you can draw real animals really well, and you want to draw real animals really well because you love them, that translates into the imaginary animals. That's what makes the difference. And you got to be dedicated. You got to, you know, study the anatomy with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul. You got to combine those two things. Uh, creature design to be successful 
I think you need to be a generalist within your specialty. Elaborate on that. A generalist within your specialty. So the jobs I've had range for anywhere from doing very accurate paleontological reconstructions for scientists mm -hmm. to very realistic depictions of wildlife you know, for scientific or zoos or whatever, or publishers, to obviously imaginary, realistic imaginary animals that can be animated, to not so realistic imaginary animals that can be animated, or very highly exaggerated and designed animals to the point where we're talking about, say, aesthetics that are similar to the Incredibles and such. And uh, so I've, I've done a wide range of jobs within the category of creature design. Even toy design can be creature design. I've worked with Disney Imagineering um, regarding Star Wars creatures for the parks. And, and so we're talking about, you know, mechanics, you know, in a way. Um, as, as I mentioned before, I've designed animal-themed cookie jars. Mm -hmm. I've designed pretty wacky, almost Hanna-Barbera-style animal characters for cartoon series or, or things like that. But the, the common theme is that it all has to do with animals. And, and of course, you, you do need to draw, be able to draw people well, too. So consider people to also be animals. Because animals and people often appear in the same production together. So that's important. So just consider, you know, human beings also as, you know, another animal to draw. Yeah, why be be a generalist within your specialty is that's that's how I would describe it. Okay. And and this is involving the fact that animals all across the board, human and invertebrates and vertebrates and mammals and reptiles and birds all share things in common, but I also heard in there something that is not often mentioned. Uh, some teachers have emphasized it, Nicolaides and Bridgman a little bit, but that you're emphasizing and that is empathy. That is that the animal is more than anatomy. The animal is something with needs, interests, emotions, uh, feelings, deals with weight deals with pressure, has to survive. It seems like in some of the teaching that you've offered, you've emphasized the animal's relationship to the environment and how are they making a living? How are they eating? How are they protecting themselves? How are they getting uh, food if they're predators or if they, do they live high? Do they live low? Where are the threats from different angles? Is that right? I mean, it seems like I've had that reported to me either from you or from your students that animal and environment relationship is something you fit into your training? Absolutely. Because the whole appearance of an animal has to do with allowing it to survive and not just to survive, but to thrive mm -hmm. in its native, native environment. And even outside of its native, native environment, um, life wants to live. Uh, Zebras, interestingly enough, you know, they're, they're, you know, uh, they come from, well, let's say plains zebras. They are basically an East African species and it's not really known to get a lot. I mean, it does get cold in Africa, but not where you're getting like snowfall. But you can take that zebra and put it in a zoo in upstate New York. And like other horses, it will grow a furry coat in the wintertime. Wow. Yeah, that's just kind of an interesting fact. Yeah. But uh, um, a zebra or any other animal, they are their bodies and minds are designed to survive. And then, if the animal is in a society, for example, let's take zebras again. They live in a society, and a zebra society is of small families that every so often will band together in caravans and make a monthly and make a, a yearly migration trek. Mm -hmm. So when you see a vast herd of zebras, it's not like a it's it's like a caravan of little families traveling together, and that's similar to what mustangs and other wild horses do. And that support of the family is what allows a social animal like that to be somewhat safe, or it has it has time to play, has time to explore, has time to improve its mental faculties. Mm -hmm. And then you begin to realize you know, these animals are beings that, as you mentioned, they have needs, they have emotions, they make decisions. And that opens up a whole world of like, it's not just an, 
an object. It's not an object to be exploited or hurt. It's, it's something to be wondered at. When you're designing, you think about these things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I've been very fortunate in that at this point in my life, I, I love to ride. I have two horses. Um, one is a, a mare, an off-the-track thoroughbred mare named Angelina. Mm-hmm. And she's learning how to be a dressage horse. And mm-hmm. she's basically in first grade. Wow. It's very an, a sweet natured horse, but she's learning how to move her body in such a way that she's going to be able to do some really pretty movements. Uh-huh. And then I have an, another horse. He's a gelding. He's twelve. His name is Vader. Uh-huh. His, his full name I named him this is Darth J Vader. That is Darth Jolly Vader because he's a jolly personality, but he's all black with one little white star. And he's already been to college and graduated, so I call him my schoolmaster. So I have one, a horse that I can enjoy honing my own riding skills and the other one is learning how to be a good riding horse. Wow. But their personalities and their intelligence is pretty marvelous. They have distinct personalities. They behave a little bit differently from one another. You can see their little, their, their brains working when they're trying to figure things out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, if there wasn't a particular type of latch on their stall, when, um, they would easily let themselves out of their stalls and then let the other horses out of the stall. Mm. Once a horse learns how to manipulate a latch, it will let itself out and let its friends out. And then the other horses watch it and they also learn how to let themselves out. Wow. This so, is like raising kids. Yeah, they are. They, and so, you, you, I see them you know, on, a, on a day-to-day basis and it's striking how very intelligent these these animals are and i think the more miraculous thing is i mean you're riding this horse this is an animal the size of a moose mm-hmm. it's very strong it's very intelligent it could kill you if it wanted to yeah but it doesn't it yeah. doesn't that yeah that is a phenomenal thing in itself is that it it has the physical power and yet it's got some emotional bearing that sees you yeah. as the boss. About two weeks ago, I wasn't able to make it to the barn because we were having ice storms here in Oregon. And it was reported to me that my two horses were not happy about it. They were fussing, they were banging around. And then when I came back, they settled down. And it was kind of sweet to hear. <laughs> the phrase you used was a generalist within a specialty. Mm-hmm. And when you have students, students that you have hopes for, Uh do you give them a lot of information about these things like you just mentioned about zebras and about how horses work? Or do you you put them onto something where they're doing their own research to get their, to dig out all sorts of interesting and useful insights about an animal or a little of both? How does it work with your approach to students? I do both those things in my in my lectures. I give, you know, interesting facts about animals that are related to a particular type of animal group that we would be studying for each lesson. And then yes, I do encourage them to do their research and for part of their assignment at least for schoolism is they need to do at least two pages of sketches of real animals that are related to the creature type that they would be designing. For example, I, if it's going to be, let's see, lesson four, and we are designing canine, feline-ish creatures, they need to submit a couple of pages of, of sketches of, you know, lions, tigers, whatever in that group, and uh, be able to at least know more about the animal group so they can apply that knowledge and, and idiosyncrasies, interesting things they find out, to the creatures they are designing. Huh. And it was intended to give them an empathy for real animals so that will, that will translate into their imagined animals. Terrell, that sounds wonderful. I wish I was in your class. And also, those of you listening, you've got, you've got two things here. One is uh, you've got a lot of access to Terrell's work. You are one of the few people I know that have three books on Amazon that are just pure five-star 
reviews, <laughs> uh, including the Animals Real and Imagine one, which, how would you describe this? Is it, You've got the one on uh, the science uh, and then the one on the principles of uh -huh. creature design and then yes. the Real and Imagined. How would you describe this? Well, Animals and Real Imagined, that was the first one that I did for um, Design Studio Press. Right. And what that was is that came out of, I was teaching for about two and a half years um, at the Academy of Art University. Mm -hmm. And that came about of the demos that I did in class. The classes were generally between three and six hours several times a week. And so I would you know, lecture and then I would do a demo on the various animals. And so many of those illustrations are those, are those demos. So these are demos from class. Yes. Yeah. There's the next thing that you have as listeners. You can have Terrell as a teacher. <laughs> she is available. Terrell, there's another thing you and I have talked about regarding students that's important for their career and particularly important at this time in history. And that is what they do, whether they work for a client, work for hire, do their own thing. What's your advice to students about this? Obviously, an art director should be able to tell you apart from other artists. And so often, and I think in this particular generation, this particular generation upcoming has grown up on lots of media, uh, lots of animation and such that's so accessible. And, you know, I didn't have that opportunity. If I wanted to see a, a Disney movie, I had to pay a ticket and see it when it came around. It wasn't just there for me to download or for me to have on a DVD to look at endlessly, nor was this all this marketing of, you know, coloring books and Disney thing. I love Disney and or whatever. I could might as well even say you know, DreamWorks or whoever. So I, 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 this is, this is all a positive thing. But when I was little, I didn't have, I was not shaped by what something is supposed to look like. So when I drew a lion, it was a lion. And then from there, I could make any kind of stylized lion I wanted to. But today, I see students and professionals all drawing and painting in the same exact manner, mm. where it looks like it's all by one artist. And that's not good because there's always going to be one artist that's going to be less expensive than you that draws exactly the way you do. Uh. <laughs> and I was never hired because. I drew like or painted like any everybody else. Far from that. And my peers, you know, like Doug, like Ian McKaig, like Claire Wendling, you know who they are. Yeah. They don't look like anybody else but themselves. It is so important to be able to maintain that voice. Because when I have been hired by Disney, when I have been hired, you know, let's say by DreamWorks or any other car, they've hired me for for the voice I bring. Yeah. And when they hire Ian, they hire him for the voice he brings. Or, you know, Marshall, for you, for the voice you bring. But I think that's missing um, now. And I, and I, I think, yeah, you, you guys need to be able to have your own voice. It's so important. And, or I'm thinking of James Gurney, Dinotopia, yeah. like his marvelous artwork. Mm -hmm. We love his work because it's so beautiful and so unique. Mm -hmm. And he's not trying to be anybody else but himself. And he's only competing with himself. And the only people you need to compete with are your own selves. Uh, now, this, this sameness comes from a lot of what's happening and hot right now. Yes. And being so fed on what's happening and hot right now that it's almost impossible to imagine anything that isn't what's already going on. Oh. And, and – how do, you, how do you help students beyond that to find their own voice? For me, it's always been looking at nature because nature is a template. If you understand and love nature and nature is your anchor for artistic inspiration, then that sets you free to not have to draw in a particular, in a particular mold. You know, um, there's, there's so many different ways you can draw a lion. You know, um, uh, Mustafa is a beautifully designed character for The Lion King, but there's so many other ways that you can draw a lion. Mm -hmm. But I see people trapped into that kind of a mold or a particular, say, anime mold. And I'm not saying anything against that, but for all design in the same manner, then that's 
sort of sad. It's like um, making a sequel and then another sequel and another sequel. And of course, Hollywood does that anyway. Yeah. That's part of the realities of marketing, yes. That yes, it's, if, if your goal is to make money, then your goal is to make money, not right. necessarily to do something better or different that's risky and might not make money. But part of what I'm hearing you say is what I've heard before is that you look at masters and you look at art and that's important, but it's also important to look away from it to the thing that inspired it in the first place yes. and see what kind of individual response we have to nature, which might be so different from what everybody else is doing, which may, again, it may be risky, but it also, it, it's more likely to be original if we've got this personal response. Well, for example, when, you know, I ha when, I, when I'm hired for Disney, and Brother Bear is a good example. So, I was hired by Disney to do conceptual work for the, the animated feature Brother Bear. Brother Bear is, is um, a very, for 2D animation, a very naturalistic production. I mean, obviously, there are stylizations and such. What's so neat about what Disney does is they will hire conceptual artists not to reinvent the wheel but to add a unique voice at the very tippy top of, of, of uh, when, a, when, a, when a production is being shaped and, and imagined and, 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 and felt. And your voice, your unique voice is what they're hiring you for. So when I was hired to, to design bears and moose and other animal denizens of the um, ancient um, north, um, northwest. Mm -hmm. That's what they hired me for, so I could, to bring that naturalism and the empathy of the animal for that production. And of course, the anatomy f was important for the animators, but they wanted to, that to be able to translate into the film. And that's what Disney does. Disney is marvelous in that they will use nature. They'll start at nature as their starting point, and then they will design outward from that or edit nature. And that's what I'm trying to say. They didn't hire me because I, you know, could draw Mickey Mouse. They hired me because I had a, um, an empathy and a love and in the facility for maintaining that in animal art. Now, that's working for a company. That's working for a project that someone else has initiated. Yes. You've done stuff on your own as well. Yes. Tell us about that. All right. Well, and that's a really interesting story in this my my book, The Katurin Odyssey. It's just been republished by Design Studio Press. Yay! The Katurin Odyssey. The Katurin Odyssey, yes. And that came about when I was it was as the Phantom Menace was wrapping up. And, you know, I just spent the last, the prior three years in basically in, in world building uh -huh. because Star Wars, that's, that's world building. And I wanted, I had an idea for, you know, a world of my own. And it was of this planet, an Earth-like planet that was inhabited entirely by all kinds of animals, real animals, but they could be prehistoric animals as well, all living together on this beautiful planet. And they could understand each other. There was, a, you know, a, com a common lingo, but they also had their own languages and stuff. And in doing so, I had to think about not just the the main characters, but the environment, and not just the environment, but the politics, um, travel, trade, um, prejudice, religion, you name it. I had to think about that, and then come up with a good story regarding that. And I was um, very fortunate in that I was able to collaborate with a very good designer and producer and a screenwriter. And we were able to create this property called the Katurin Odyssey. That was just the, one of the biggest joys that I had ever had in my life to do. It was originally published by Simon & Schuster. Mm -hmm. in um, 2004. And so, here's where a very hard part comes in. Uh. We tr touched on this a little bit briefly earlier in, but this was a real hard part of my life in that, and this happens in both publishing and in the movie business. There are regime changes. 
There's a film that gets greenlit and suddenly it's ungreenlit. And I went through a number of those at ILM. And that's hard. But when it's your own baby... Um, so the book's published by Simon & Schuster. But just as it was being published, there was a regime change. The person who was in charge of that book and with marketing it and promoting it, he went on to a different company. And there was a lot of ill will that was created there up in the, um, you know, the, in Simon & Schuster. And all his projects, including Katura, were remaindered. They were dropped and remaindered. And so uh, I believe it was, was it Barnes & Noble? Um, bought it and it was remaindered at Barnes and Noble. It was never, it was never promoted. The neat thing about it, of course, it was, it was snatched up and all the copies were sold within a couple of weeks. But that's what happened. It disappeared. And that was like somebody killing my child. Yeah. It's got its analogy in the animal kingdom is that when the new Lion King comes in, you got to destroy all of the ones beforehand just to show who's boss. Ah. And yeah, I've seen that happen a number of times in, in organizations. So, the, the Katurian Odyssey was a victim of that. It was. It was. And we had a beautiful hardcover book, you know, and lovely. We, there was so much um, anticipation for it, but then it disappeared. And that was when, like I mentioned, one of the blackest periods in my life. And uh, I had spent, I had put three years of my life into that. And, and that, it's, it's at that point where, okay, let's just find something steady. And I, that's where I taught at the Academy of Art University for two and a half years before getting back into the industry. It was kind of like just needing to, to recover from that. It just, it just t tore my heart out. And, you know, the hearts of the individuals that, you know, also put their hearts into it too. Yeah. But, you know, things come around again. And so it's just been republished by Design Studio Press. And I'm so grateful and happy about that. And so there's other interesting things that are now happening regarding the Katerin Odyssey. I can't say that much about it right now, but let's just say the technology wasn't available back in um, 2004 that is available now. I'm glad to hear it. Was, it, was this with, uh, with Scott? Yeah, Design Studio Press is, is Scott's company. With, with Scott Robertson is what you've, yeah. you've yeah. Uh, republished it with. And it was yeah. Robert Gould that you Scott. collaborated with? Yeah. Okay. And, and in particular, also Tinty Day, she's a senior editor there at uh, Design Studio Press. But the Concurrent Odyssey itself was a collaboration between myself, um, producer Robert Gould, and, and then David Weger was the screenwriter, which put my idea into very lovely prose. And the book itself is designed as a cinematic novel. It's kind of a pioneering book in that the main spreads are all in standard film aspect ratio, the same um, format that you'd see in the big screen or on your you know, large scale smart television. And the um, illustrations um, between the spreads are all the same type of illustrations that you would design in the conceptual phase for a motion picture. And so this is a book which sort of reads like a movie. It's fully illustrated, absolutely fully illustrated. And the text overlays it like, you know, a narrative voice. Yeah. I am so glad this has a happy uh, outcome. Oh, me too. the uh, three yeah. years of your life, having it uh, pulled away from you. And, uh, and now it's back. Now, yeah. as far you own these characters, you own these yes. images. This is your IP. It is. It is. And that's one of the things that makes it special. The artwork in my other books that are, is published by Design Studio Press. I mean, you know, a lot of those artworks are also des designed by myself. Some are there by permission from different clients. But Katura is its own world. It's its own integrated world. It's its own brand. It all works together. It's its own story. The others are, you know, 
bits and pieces of from various productions or ideas and such, but the, but the, the difference is that, is that Kajur is a world that stands on its own. That's great. How do you encourage students to do likewise? Write down your ideas. Huh? You know, if you have a great idea, write it down no matter where you are. I mean, I, I have in each room of my house and in my car, I have something to write on if I get an idea. Write that down first and then nurture those thoughts and keep writing those things down. What is it that you want to tell the world? What is the story you want to tell the world? And bear in mind that you may have to make some compromises, mm. you know, just to get it out there. Um, it's one thing to create this beautiful picture and your friends say, oh, that's so great, you know, and is it going to fly as far as the realities of a publisher buying it? A, a studio buying it, um, that's where you might have to say, well, I might have to work with other people or compromise a bit. But if it's your own IP, there are fewer compromises. There are fewer compromises, yes. But there are still compromises? There are maybe some. I changed the pl we changed the plot a little bit to make it more streamlined. You need to not be able to hang on to every single detail and every little bunny trail you might want to have in your story. Uh, the, the thing is, is what is the main objective? What is what is the main thing your story wants to tell? Mm -hmm. You might think of all these other cool little details, and then you ha what you need to do with that is say, okay, let's get the main story out. These other little details, we'll save that for the sequel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is one of the surprising limitations of or drawbacks of an IP is that when there's nothing to push up against, when there's nobody, when we can do whatever we want to do, we may indulge things yeah. that we didn't realize we were indulging because they were so fun to indulge, but that the audience may not want. So, right. the hard-nosed producer who says, no, 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 may be a pain, but also plays a role, which is that I will be the filter to say that everything you do doesn't get in. So, that means that when we're doing our own IPs, we either need to have a relationship with someone who plays that role or we have to be able to kick into nurture the imposter syndrome for a bit Yes. to keep us in check. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things when, you know, working, working with Robert, because he has been a producer, he has been in this biz for ages, both in publishing, both in movies and all that. So, plus, you know, being a good friend, which was great. I mean, that was a nice advantage. But if there is something that he said, you know, this is, this is fun for you, but it's really not going to be in the, for the best for the object, you know, you're going to have to let that go. Okay, fine. And it was, it was great. It was kind of, and then, and it, and it was better. Tara, where do students go if they say, if their, their interest is, I want to develop my own world. I've got my world of characters. I've got my story ideas. I might even have a small team of people that we feel like we've really got something special going on. Where do they go, not just for the story training, because the story training and the drawing training, uh, you and I both are involved in training students toward that. But yes. the legal things and the financial things and this, you're starting a business, you may even trademark your name, all of that other stuff. Do you know of a resource that we can send students uh, who are motivated to develop their own IPs to? A good place to start might be, it's, it's in LA, it's called Council, Council for Creatives. Council and it's for a legal Creatives. Firm. Council for Creatives. I think uh, Jonathan Tobin was my contact there, and that might be a that would be perhaps a good place to get started as far as copyright law, um, the, um, keeping your protecting your property, protecting your IP, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. They're there to help artists, and uh, that would be a good place to start. I mean, you may have to pay them a fee for something, but I think it's fairly reasonable. Right, and it can save you a fortune. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sure. Anything else? Well, you know, this is not um, the design for the entertainment industry. It's not an easy industry, you know, um, to, to be in. We do art because we love to do art and it's 
icing on the cake to be paid to do art. It's important to remember that when we are designing for a client, regardless of who, the, who they are, they're paying us to create a property, create a product for them. And so you've got to not um, get too personally involved, other than doing an excellent job, with that particular thing that you're designing. Like you might disagree with the client thinking, well, gee, you know, I think my dragon looks better painted purple and yellow and they might like it. Well, no, I want it to be red and blue. But you got to let the client, you know, and have the final say uh, as far as how that goes. Uh, if you, you know, you're not going to be hanging it on your wall, but the client's paying you money to, so they can, so in effect, hang it on their wall and do things to, with it. So that was, that's something to, to keep in mind. So you're not, you're not treating art for yourself other than the excellence and the, and the experience of creating the artwork. Uh, your portfolio is never going to be perfect. There's never going to be at any one time. It's going to be perfect. It's going to only be the best it is at any one time. So you always make sure your portfolio contains the best work you have at that particular time. It's, um, that's something I can, I can safely say. Persistence. Persistence is important. Uh, having your own voice is so very important. And uh, cultivate good friends and in in this industry because you you will need you will need them uh, because it, it can be hard. <laughs> uh, networking and friendships are an often neglected huge arena of where yeah. career success yeah. ha happens more than anything else. Somebody asked a student asked Vance Kovacs, "How do you get jobs?" And he said, your friends. And that was pretty much all he said. He's right. Yeah. And most of my jobs have come either directly or indirectly from friends and people or, or friends or people that they know, mm -hmm. friends and recommendations from people that they know. I can't think of a single job, really. I mean, especially early on, um, out of the blue, that didn't have some sort of friend somewhere in, 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 in the thread. Yeah. Do you have opinions about the high cost of art schools and students going into debt in oh. order to get their degrees in order to go out into the world and make a career? Oh my goodness. I think it's terrible the way so many brick and mortar art schools are as expensive as medical school. Mm -hmm. Artists, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but usually artists don't make as much as heart surgeons, you know, or brain surgeons or even pedi pediatricians. Usually, yeah. But to be in debt for the rest of your professional life, it's that's 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 hard. I and mean, we're not talking small amounts. We're talking at least a couple of grand a month in some cases. That's crippling. I have never been asked where I went to school. I have never been asked for my college transcripts, you know, what my GPA was. Never in my entire life, working life, have I been asked where I went to school, mm -hmm. you know, from a, from a job point of view, from mm -hmm. every point of view. The client was only interested in my skills, mm -hmm. you know, what I could bring to the table. And, you know, my background, I didn't go through a four-year art school. Most of my background is in zoology. I went to a junior college to save some money. And then I went to um, Sonoma State University, majored in vertebrate zoology. And then, you know, some couple semesters at, you know, two couple different art schools. You know, I eventually did get a degree from the Academy of Art University, which wasn't accredited at the time that I got my degree. Mm -hmm. But nobody, Lucasfilm didn't say, what did you get? What are your transcripts? You know, what this? They, they didn't want to, they didn't care. They didn't care. Yeah. Nobody cared. Uh, and um, so there are ways you can put together nowadays, I think, an art, good art education. Take advantage of your JC, by all means. That's a smart thing to do. Take, you know, they're going to teach you the same stuff that you would learn at an expensive art school in your freshman and sophomore years. Yeah. Um, and and Terrell's not saying this because I teach at the JC. In fact, I don't even know if you knew, knew that I teach at the JC. I didn't know you taught at the yeah, JC. I, no. I teach at the, the community college in Fullerton, and I have for 30, almost 38 years now. Yay. I don't leave it for this reason. It's a 
inexpensive way to get something that students were paying $3,000 a semester yeah. to get from me in another school just a, a number of miles away. So, why not? Why not take advantage of, of, of that? Amen. Also, uh, online and t any teacher you want now, including you, mm -hmm. is available to a student. So, well. this... This new IP is that I'm designing the 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 new the new uh, design your own education is that you're able to put in there the teachers that you want. Yes, you know, for example, um, schoolism that's that was uh, established by you know Bobby Chu. And we all know Bobby Chu is a wonderful, incredibly talented artist and a genuinely wonderful person. I mean, it's a great combination, and he has a real empathy for students and, and their, their, their struggles and challenges. Right. And he chooses his faculty that also understand that as well. And all the faculty, of course, are very high-profile working artists in the industry. The cost of attending schoolism, even if, even if you're going for the mentored portion, uh -huh. is a fraction of the expense that you would incur at, you know, more one of those brick and mortar institutions yeah. and, but you and you're getting instructions from artists that are working and they can cut to the chase saying hey this is what's this is the reality here you know and yeah. uh, uh, and there's other online schools as well there are many brick and mortar schools that say we'll see our graduates are they're hired by all these high-end studios and these game companies and stuff well that may be so but and technically, what they say may be true, but that student might only be hired, say, to work on a particular job for maybe a week. Mm -hmm. Because some jobs only last a week. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there, but there's more often than not, there's students that pay hundreds, well, tens of thousands of, jo of dollars, and they never work in the industry. Well, I can see it on your face that you share the same concern that I share, which is how much fallout happens. We did, yes. we did eight episodes last year, uh, Terrell, on uh, design your own art school, art school as project. And a big theme of it was now you are not limited to what a school gives you. You are free to make yes. choices from whichever, t uh, whichever teachers you need. Well, thank you for this. This has been really enjoyable. It's been a privilege to get to interview you. And I think there were useful things in here. So, thanks for being here, Tara. Oh, thank, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor. It's always an honor. You're welcome. Thank you. And thanks for checking in with us, everybody. Yay. Okay, Tara. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> See you You're again. welcome.